A blessed Easter to all of you. It's remarkable as we mark this day of the Lord's resurrection that there is no appearance of the risen Lord. One would think that on a day in which the Lord blasts through the tomb of death that the church would give us one of those passages of the gospel that has Jesus come before the disciples to eat with them, invite them to touch his wounds. But instead, we have a text today in which Jesus, the risen Lord, is absent. All the attention, however, is on three disciples. And so it is an invitation for us to see how the resurrection of Jesus has an impact on those disciples and also to look at how it has an impact on us. We see, first of all, Mary. She is one who is close to the Lord, no doubt disappointed and heart-stricken by the fact that the one that she loved very quickly was accused of a crime and put on a cross to die. The very short time between the Last Supper and the cross is something that no doubt shocked her. And so she gets up in the darkness of the early morning to go to the tomb. There's something stirring in her, some impulse that this can't be true, or at least it can't be the end of the story. And so she goes to the tomb and finds that the stone is rolled away. It is an opportunity for us to see how within our own hearts there is a hope stirring that no matter the difficulty we face today, whether it's illness, financial setbacks, broken relationships, disappointments that we have, maybe even fears about the future in society, the Lord like he does with Mary, stirs in our hope, our hearts, that there is a hope. I was talking some years ago to a woman who was a survivor of the Holocaust, and she told me that her aunt would tell her when she was a young girl suffering there in one of the camps, tomorrow will be better, tomorrow will be better. That is the hope that's in Mary's heart and which the Lord asks us to be in contact with as we come here on this Easter day, to stir in our heart the hope that God's work is not yet finished, that the darkness before us will be lifted. And then we have Peter. You know, Peter did not maybe know where the tomb was and so John had to go ahead because he wasn't at the cross like John was. He was afraid, which allowed him to deny Jesus, that he ever knew him, that he was one of his disciples. And he overcomes that fear in a particular moment in this scene, not only going to the tomb, but he's the first one of the disciples to enter into it. He enters into the death of Jesus, even though he was not at the cross when Jesus died. It is an invitation for us as well to put aside our own fear of dying. Yes, in terms of our mortality and our own death, but also the fears of giving ourselves to others, of dying to our selfishness and maybe our pride in accepting the apology of another or apologizing to another in bringing about healing. Dying to ourselves in the way that we give of our lives to our families and our children, dying to ourselves in the way that we go out of our way to help someone else in the world and sacrifice. So that when we celebrate the Eucharist, you can make, each one of us can make our own those words, this is my body given up for you, my blood shed for you. Not to be afraid of dying for others. It is Peter who goes into the tomb that reminds us that in fact we share in the death of the Lord in a way that no longer makes us fearful of dying, our own physical death, 
or the many ways in which we're called to die each day, that there is something more. And finally, we have John. John was at the foot of the cross. He was one who was there because of his love for Jesus. And we see that love also present in this moment in which he comes to the tomb and enters the tomb with Peter. He's there because he knows that his love will carry him through, will link him to Jesus. And so it's an invitation for us as well to remember the power of love in our life. As St. Paul says, there are great things, faith, hope in our lives, but love is the only thing that lasts forever. Every time that we love another person, we do something in terms of the value it has for all eternity. But John also is one, in addition to loving Jesus, loves the church. Because Jesus says to him, behold your mother, mother behold your son. And the mother is Mary who is a symbol of the church. Some time ago I was asked, who had the greatest influence on my vocation to be a priest? It wasn't another priest, but it was my parents and the sisters who taught me, the Benedictine sisters of Atchison, because what they taught me was to love the church. It was out of that love for the church that motivated me to become a priest. And so today, as we hear about the beloved disciple who was entrusted with the church, entrusted with Mary, the mother of the whole church, it's an opportunity for us to once again stir in our hearts a love for Jesus, but also a love for the church in the way that we participate, the way that we contribute our gifts and talents, the way that we also come to worship each Sunday. We do it not out of an obligation, but out of love, because we know that that kind of love, like all loves, will last forever. It's true, Jesus is not present on this Easter day, but his power of the resurrection is. It stirs in the hearts of those disciples, stirs by giving hope to Mary in a moment of desperation, stirs in the hearts of Peter so that he no longer is afraid of death, and stirs in the heart of the beloved disciple who loves Jesus in the church because he first was loved. So today, let us witness to the resurrection of the Lord by once again being in touch with the stirrings in our hearts, the stirring of the resurrection, so that we are brought, like Jesus, to new life.